come on a journey to lost civilizations. See ancient artifacts and long lost ancient scrolls. The strange writing on this clay brick is known as cuneiform. Now the script was used Take the journey of a lifetime and travel to ancient Babylon and the island of Patmos to discover how ancient mysteries reveal the future. A live seminar series. Don't miss any program. Uh, I tell you what, I'm really excited that you guys made a decision to be here tonight because the topic that I'm going to share with you is, um, I mean, it's one of the most important things is going to affect your eternity. Last night we talked about the allegiance and the idea of worship, how Satan is in the business of deceiving the hearts and the minds of men and women. But at the same time, God is proclaiming a message to every single nation, kingdom, tongue and people in order to rescue people from deception. So tonight we're going to look at the Antichrist, in a way the, the weapon or the institution that Satan has used in order to bring deception and confusion that leads eventually to destruction, but at the same time to find the salvation that is uh, available through Jesus Christ. So our first session, Antichrist, history's greatest uh, hoax. And we're going to unpack this in our first session. We'll have the banquet after that. And then we'll come back for our second uh, presentation. Now, when people think of Antichrist, a number of names come up. About uh, 20 years ago, there's a Jewish guy that had tattooed uh, number 666 on his forehead. And he identified himself as the Antichrist. And some people really believed him. Others didn't. But obviously, he wasn't the guy. In the year 2000, the newspaper talked about Prince Charles and President Clinton at that time as being the possible antichrist of the world. But it turned out not to be the case. You know, people come up with different stories and they, they create some scenarios and they may not happen. The thing is, tonight we want to go to the Bible because we have seen that based on the science of archaeology, also based on history, based on the reliability of the prophecy that we have seen in the Bible, we can trust what the Bible talks about, when the Bible talks about different topics, and we're going to find the answer about Antichrist when it comes uh, to Bible uh, interpretation. When you go through the New Testament, you find a number of references to Antichrist, and what's fascinating to see is that all of these references come actually from in the Old Testament, that faithful book that we've been studying nearly every night, the book of Daniel. You know, it is the book that was discovered in Qumran. The Dead Sea Scrolls, they date back to 100 to 200 B.C., and of course, those are only copies of the originals that were written around 530 B.C. And in the book of Daniel, we have amazing insights about the Antichrist and how today in the 21st century, we can identify this power. In one of the visions that Daniel had in Babylon, he saw four beasts. Do you remember these creatures? Do you remember? Uh, the first one was uh, the lion. Uh, we've got the bear, the leopard, and then a beast, sorry, uh, a beast that had, in a way, no description, was just like out of ordinary. And when we look at four beasts, what Daniel is actually communicating to us, he says, when you see four beasts, you need to think of four powers or four kingdoms. And he gives us the verse in Daniel 7, 23. He says, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth. You know, Bible is sometimes... It appears to be difficult, but it's not. It really pushes us to dig deeper in order to find the treasure within its word. If we, are, if we think about our world today, if we were to see a cartoon with a kiwi, the kangaroo, and an eagle sitting at a table, what would you think? You think that America, Australia, and New Zealand are having a conference. <laughs> you know, even today we're having animals that are representing nations. And 2,500 years ago, it was the same. Same situation. You had animals, uh, beasts, they were representing different powers. Uh, Babylon, just very quickly, I'm going to go through uh, 
refresher. This lion was very different because it had wings. Now, tell me, when was the last time when you saw a lion with wings? Put your hand up. Just now? <laughs> I would have been worried. <laughs> Now, do you know what's fascinating? And I said, when I first presented this a uh, couple of weeks, I said, you know, keep this in mind because it's a fascinating element. You know, prophecy in the Bible is specific. I want you to remember this aspect about prophecy. Prophecy is specific, it's particular. And you've got this line with wings that Daniel says it represents Babylon. Interestingly, as you went through the Ishtar Gate in, in the old city of Babylon, you would see lions with wings depicted on the procession walls as you're going into the city of Babylon. It was quite a fitting image for, for that power, for the kingdom. Now the second one was a bear, and the Bible says it was lopsided, and it had three ribs in its mouth. And all of this, again, prophecy is very specific. The bear was lopsided because it represented a power made out of two kingdoms the Medes and the Persians. It was lopsided because one power was stronger than the other. The Persians were stronger. The king of the empire was always a Persian king. Now, it had three ribs. Sounds like dinner time to me, right? They were very succulent, you know, <laughs> juicy ribs. And it represented the conquest that this kingdom had done in that area. One was Lydia, which is Turkey nowadays. You've got Babylon number two and Egypt. This was the area where the Medes and the Persians have expanded three major conquests. That's why the bear had three ribs. Prophecy is very specific. Number three, uh, the third kingdom was represented by a leopard with four wings and also four heads. You've got uh, uh, represented the kingdom of Greece, Alexander the Great being the king, but when Alexander the Great died, there was no other king to replace him. You've got the wings representing the speed. It's not just a leopard being a fast animal with the aid of wings, you know. Uh, at the age of 31, he had conquered the then known world. And he cried and said, there's nothing more for me to conquer. He was depressed, like, what am I going to do now? He got drunk and he died. Uh, but then when Alexander the Great died, there was no kingdom Sorry, there was no king that followed him. There were four generals, the head of five who was going to be in control, so the kingdom was divided into four, se into, into four sections. That's why the leopard had four heads. And for me, this is like, boom. It's like, how is it possible for the Word of God to be so specific? And the Bible tells us it is for our benefit that we may have a solid foundation for us to believe that the Word of God is not just another book, but rather it is the Word of God uh, for our benefit in order to give us understanding about the future. Um, these are the names of uh, the generals. Uh, it may not interest you that much. And last one was a beast that uh, basically didn't come up with another. It didn't say elephant or whatever animal. It was like a beast. He said, I cannot describe it. It didn't look like anything I've seen before. It was a beast. And this beast had something specific about it. It had ten horns, and it was the fourth kingdom. It was the kingdom of Rome. Uh, ten horns, and the whole beast was like made of uh, iron. It says the ten horns are the ten kings which shall arise from this kingdom. Now, what was the significance of that? If you go back and you remember the, the dream that King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had in Daniel chapter 2, he had the head of gold, the chest of silver, the thighs of bronze, the legs of iron, and then the feet, partly of iron, partly of clay. But you've got ten toes. So after these four kingdoms, you get a division of ten territories. And here you have a beast with ten Horns representing the same things, ten territories. So when Rome came to an end in 476 A.D., you had the formation of ten countries within Western Europe. And you've got here uh, on the map, or what we have today, you know, Spain, Portugal, uh, France, Italy, and so on. But prophecy goes on saying that out of those ten horns, something happened. Three of them were completely uprooted, which would mean that three nations were completely destroyed. And then a little horn came out, and this one was very 
distinct from the rest of the horns. Now, what is this little horn? This will be a key element for us to understand who the Antichrist is and what's his mission. Are you with me so far? This is going to give us the key to understand that. I was considering, this is Daniel in vision, I was considering the horns and there was another horn, a little one. So again, prophecy is specific. And I would like you to already play these elements in your mind. If the horns represent territories, nations, countries, and here we have a little horn, that means this nation is little. It's not great, it's not the magnificent, it's little. A little one coming up among them before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. So like completely eradicated. And there, in this horn, were eyes like the eyes of a man. Again, elements that you do not see in the other seven remaining horns. And a mouth speaking pompous words. And she'll speak pompous words against the Most High. Now, who is the Most High? God is the Most High. And we also have seen that when Jesus was on earth, he wasn't just a human being. He was God on earth. So when this little horn speaks against the Most High, he actually speaks against Jesus Christ. That's what makes the little horn the Antichrist. Because he speaks against the Most High. He speaks against the Christ. He is the Antichrist. So, who or what is Antichrist? Is it a person? Is it a power? Is it a nation? What is it? We're going to go to university history and to the history of Christianity. We're going to do a bit of history tonight in order to understand exactly what's going on in biblical prophecy. And we're going to start with the very beginning when Jesus was still on earth. Uh, he planted the seed of truth into people's hearts, and that happened in Jerusalem. But because of persecution and other reasons, uh, Christianity had to go away from Jerusalem, and they went to Antioch, that is today Syria, went on to Turkey, went on to... Uh, Greece, and then Alexandria, and then eventually went to Rome. But then we know, according to uh, Bible and history, in the year 70 AD, the Roman general Titus came, surrounded uh, Jerusalem, destroyed everyone, killed, destroyed the temple. So basically, the leadership that was once in Jerusalem was now gone and moved out of there. And uh, you know, the Christianity continued to spread around and Rome started to become a center of leadership in what it comes to Christianity. History tells us that Christianity in Rome increasingly influenced, was increasingly influenced by pagan beliefs. Because all of a sudden you find yourself in a new culture, a new environment with new uh, powers to influence your behavior. And look what history tells us about it. Some of you might have had the privilege to visit Milvian Bridge in, uh, in Italy. This was one of the greatest battles of the Roman Empire. It was done between Emperor Constantine and Mac, uh, what's this guy's name? Maxentius. Maxentius. And the day before Constantine had the battle against Maxentius, he had a dream. And the dream told him this. If he was going to put the sign of the cross, you've seen a cross before, right? He was going to put the sign of the cross on his shields and also on the you know, standards or the flags of his army. He was going to win the battle against uh, his foe. So that's what he did. He put crosses on everyone's shields and on the flags, the standards. He went in the battle and he won. He was victorious. And as a result of that victory that occurred in that Milvian bridge, Constantine decided to become a Christian, and he was baptized by the bishop in Rome um, at that time. But this is what happened. Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire as a result of a dream that Constantine had and a desire for him to embrace their faith. But look what happened next. Rome became Christian. You know, so far, so good. 
But look what happened next. Christianity became pagan. It was a time of compromise. I give you a bit if you give away from you a bit. We're going to come 50-50. We're going to come halfway. Rome became Christian, but Christianity became pagan. Pagan Roman beliefs and practices flooded the church. And you might say that this is my probably biased interpretation of history. And I'd like to suggest to you this evening that it's not my biased interpretation of history. Look what historians say about this. The new Christians were, as far as thinking and habits went, the same old pagans. Just let that sentence sink in. The new Christians were, as far as thinking and habits went, the same old pagans. And nothing major took place within people's lives. It was maybe the appearance that was changed. Maybe the, the design of a building that was changed. But nothing inside a person's heart that was changed. Their surge into the churches did not wipe out paganism. On the contrary, hordes of baptized pagans meant that paganism had diluted the moral energies of organized Christianity to the point of impotence. Centuries of Christianity concise history, page 58. It's a sad history of the, of the quick decline of the standards that Christianity once had. So during that time, when the Roman Empire was collapsing between 351 and 476 AD, the Roman emperor uh, that used to live in Rome decided to move his capital from Rome to Constantinople. So they, they moved that, and as a result of that, three nations that opposed the bishops of Rome were exterminated as well because bishops asked the emperors for help. And these nations, the Ostrogoths, Heruli, and the Vandals were completely eliminated, uprooted. And keep in mind the three horns from the beast that were completely uprooted in order to make room for the little horn to come out. Why were these three wiped out? We just read before. Three nations opposed the bishops of Rome. And when the bishops asked, for emperor's help to get rid of these nations that opposed their authority, the Roman emperors listened, and they did exactly what they were told, without them knowing that they were fulfilling prophecy. For us to have now the opportunity as we look back in the past, to have the certainty that it was God who predicted the end from the beginning. So what happened next? Emperor, Roman Emperor Justinian made a uh, decree. So the Bishop of Rome had not only religious but also political power. He was the, the political and religious leader of Western Rome with, uh, with, with you know, the central, the capital in Rome because now the Roman, the, Roman uh, uh, the emperor was in Constantinople and said, you guys can lead from Rome. That's no problem for, you, for us. And that happened in 538 A.D. Not only that, but the bishops of Rome ruled as spiritual and political leaders for 100, sorry, for 1,260 years. And that's very significant as well as we compare it to the elements of prophecy. This also describes the medieval church of the Dark Ages. Now look what, what it says in the prophecy. Little Horn is the medieval church. We're talking about an institution not a person or people. We're talking about a, a system that worked in the past. And we're going to look at some identifying characteristics. And some might say, how is it possible for a church to actually fight against Christ? And you may feel a bit uncomfortable at this very moment. How is it possible for a, for a religious institution to become antichrist, to fight against Christ. I just want to draw your attention to the fact that Jesus, according to the Gospels, had 12 disciples. And the one who fought against him 
was one of his disciples. The one who betrayed him, the one who sold him for silver, the one who turned his back to Jesus was one of his 12 disciples, Judas. The attack against Jesus came from within. And what we see in prophecy, even though it may make us uncomfortable and a bit uneasy about this whole thing, prophecy is very precise and clear for us to understand that even though it does not really make sense, is, is that correct? How is it possible for, for a Christian institution to fight against Christ just as Judas, one of Jesus' followers, fought against Jesus, the same thing can happen today. And we're going to look at the identifying characteristics, and uh, you can make uh, the decision for yourself. Some of the, the things, that, the specification that we find in the prophecy are these. The power came from among the ten horns, or from Western Europe. So we had the Roman Empire with ten horns. You know, when the Roman Empire collapsed, you have ten territories. The little horn came up from the same territory. So it had to come from Western Europe. A little one coming up among them or among the ten horns. What's fascinating to note is the medieval church in Western Europe was in Rome, in Italy, one of the countries that was formed as a result of the Roman Empire collapsing. So identifying mark number one fits in the criteria. Number two, it arose after the ten horns or Western Europe. So after the ten horns, it came to power. We know the ten horns came to power in 476 when the Roman Empire collapsed. What about this religious power? The Bible says, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. So ten horns of Western Europe were in place by 476 A.D. Now, medieval church came to power in 538 A.D. This was the year when the Roman Emperor Justinian gave the bishop in Rome both political and religious authority to rule, and that was the beginning of his period of 1,260 years. Number three, medieval church replaced three of the ten horns. Remember, there were three there were ten horns and three were plucked out, before, through, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. It was said that the Vandals, Heruli, and the Ostrogoths, they were wiped out well and truly by 538 A.D. And these are all facts for you to, to check in, in history. But we're looking at these identifying marks for us to understand how is the evil one trying to deceive the minds and the hearts of men and women in, in this global war? Because we talked last night the fact that the greatest war that humanity is facing now is who are you going to worship? It is a war about worship. We talked about the first angel's message last night saying, Worship him who created the heaven and the earth, the sea and the springs of water. In other words, worship God the creator. On the other hand, the devil says that he's going to use human institutions in order to deceive people, that he may pull them away from worshiping God and him alone. We're moving on to number four. This power actually persecuted God's people. The Bible verse says, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High. We have all agreed that the Most High is none other than God. His saints are His faithful children that are obedient to His commandments. And this religious power persecuted God's children. How is it possible for a religious power to persecute Christians? This is what history tells us the Western Watchmen. The church has persecuted. Only a Tara or a novice in church history will deny that. When she thinks uh, it's good to use physical force, she will use it. And, uh, you know, there was a, a horrific time when people were, you know, just destroyed for the simple fact of owning a Bible. And this was the time of the medieval uh, age the dark ages, and actually it was a dark time for the human history. 
Number five, would persecute for 1,260 years. This is how the prophecy puts it. Then the saints shall be given into his hands for a time and times and half a time. So here's the thing. On one hand, prophecy says God's children are going to be persecuted, but then it says they are going to be persecuted for a period of time that you may identify the power. And the period of time is given. Time, times, and half a time. Yeah. How are you going to translate that one? <laughs> right? And the beautiful thing is that I don't have to come up with the interpretation. The Bible is smart enough, if I can say, to interpret itself. And we have the interpretation found in the book of Revelation, where uh, John, in, uh, inspired by God, makes this statement, the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished. Before I read any further, the woman in the Bible represents God's faithful church. Now, God's faithful church is persecuted and she runs for protection. And the Bible says she was nourished for time, times, and half a time. The same expression that is found in Daniel. Now, John is very kind to us and he decides to interpret that period of time. He doesn't leave us in like, oh, what's next? He tells us exactly what we're talking about. The woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God. So God is the one that is protecting the church, protecting his people in the midst of this horrible time, in the midst of persecution, that they should feed her there for 1,260 days. And it's not the first time when we say that, um, you know, a day equals a year when we talk about prophecy. So here we have time, times, and half a time, 1,260 days. We can actually go into more detail to the point of suggesting that time represents a year times two years. So three and a half years. You get 360 days in a year as they were having the calendar, the Jews at the time you end up with 1,260 days. A day equals a year when you talk about prophecy. So here we have, in 538 AD, let's read this one, Emperor Justinian added political power to the bishop of Rome's religious authority. So all of a sudden, he has the authority to rule not, within the, not only within the religious spectrum, but also political, where you know, kings and princes and queens were bowing down before the Pope at that stage. So 538 AD plus 1260 years take you back to 1798. According to prophecy, you may say something had to take place in that year to bring the persecution to an end. Is that correct? Something had to take place in 1798. Now again, history tells us exactly what happened. In 1798, Napoleon sent his general by the name of Berthier, and he arrested Pope Pius VI and sentenced him to prison in, uh, in Valence, uh, France, because he said, we had enough of your leadership in terms of religion and politics. We're going to change things in Europe from now on. So in 1798, right at the end of, of the 1,260 years prophecy, the Pope is removed from Rome, and both the religious and the political powers are stripped away from this organization by Berthier, a general of Napoleon. Number six, would change God's commandments. Now this is sad because we're talking about an institution that to some extent seeks to honor God But on the other hand, it destroys the very th things that God has given to us. Now, the Bible tells us, shall intend to change times and the law. And last night we saw how important is God's law. God's law protects our relationship with God and the relationship between us as human beings. As you go through the catechism of the Catholic Church and you compare it to the Bible, you find some amazing differences or saddening differences. The first commandment, you shall have no other gods, you have it in the Bible and you have it in the catechism as well. 
when you go to the second command where it says, you shall not make for yourself a graven image or anything like it. And it goes on with this whole description. In a catechism, it's not. It's been removed. It's been selected and press delete. Number three, you shall, take, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, had become number two in the Catechism. Now look at commandment number four, which talks about the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Lord. And he goes on, you shall do no work, no you, no your son, no your daughter, not your servant. And he goes on to the whole list. And then he gives you the reason why. For in six days the Lord had created the heavens and the earth, the sea and the springs of water. This whole list of things. They have shortened it to just this sentence. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. No mention to work, no mention to creation, no mention to the reason why God had made that day special. An institution playing up with the word of God. And then he goes on uh, with the commandments, and then you see a problem with, uh, with this one. Number 10, in the Bible it says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, a wife, manservant, maidservant, and goods. And then in order for them to keep number 10, they had split number 10 into two. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife as one of the commandments, and then you shall not cover your neighbor's goods. This is not about being picky about some of the things that have taken place in Christianity. But rather this is about being wise and understanding the fulfillment of prophecy. God in His love has warned us about these things. When we looked at uh, Jesus being the Messiah and we looked at his prophecies, one of the fascinating prophecies was that Jesus was going to be betrayed by a friend that ate bread with him. Do you remember that prophecy? Amazing prophecy, hundreds of years before it was fulfilled in the life of Jesus and of course in the life of Judas. That he was going to be betrayed by a close one, by a friend. The same thing, these prophecies are given to us that we may understand that the attack of Antichrist comes from within, from within a Christian context. That we may be wise and avoid destruction and embrace salvation. As we move on, history's greatest counterfeit. Uh, how Sabbath changed from Saturday to Sunday? Because as we look into the Christian world today, uh, a lot of Christians, you know, meet on a Sunday, and if we are to look at the history and the biblical explanation for that, we're finding some, some, some contrasting op opinions. So that's what we're going to unpack from Daniel chapter 7, where it says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. Look at that as a package. Now, the only commandment that contains both time and law is the Sabbath because it's about worship and when to worship on the seventh day. The attempt to change the Sabbath was predicted 2,500 years ago. So the question is, how did it happen? How was this transition from the seventh day to the first day? Again, we're going to look at uh, history both within university and Christianity. So this is how it happened. It was a gradual change, my friends. It didn't happen all of a sudden. It was like one step at a time. You know, in order to get from black to gray, it's a gradual procession. And the same thing happened. The Sabbath was changed gradually from the seventh day to the first day of the week. And we're going to look at the historical uh, facts. In the first century, church kept the seventh day Saturday Sabbath. How do we know this? Well, first of all, Jesus and the apostles kept the seventh day Sabbath. And here we have the Bible verses. Jesus himself made this prediction. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. He was talking about the destruction of Jerusalem that was going to occur in the year 70 AD. That was 30 years later after his ascension to heaven. And Jesus said, you know, this destruction is going to come, but I beg you, pray that you won't have to run in winter or on the Sabbath, because he was still planning for people to enjoy the Sabbath as a day of rest, of day connecting with God. 
Now, Antioch, Turkey, this was the place that Paul visited, and when he went there, uh, he started to preach the message about Jesus Christ, but this is what he did. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles basically means people of other nation, those that weren't Jews. Gentiles included everyone. It means us. Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them when? So here we have not the Jews that we may say, oh, you know, Sabbath can be a Jewish thing. Gentiles begged Paul and say, hey, Paul, can you come and tell us these things next Sabbath? On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the words of God. Now, that would have been a perfect opportunity for Paul to say, hang on, guys, we don't have to wait until next Sabbath, until the next seventh day, because God has changed this. We have to meet on the first day now. But no, Paul didn't say that. Because Paul wasn't aware of any change. Because the Sabbath was still God's holy day. Thessalonica, another example, another place where Paul went and, and shared the truth about God. And this is what happened. They came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was. And I love that expression because we read the same thing about Jesus Christ last night. As his custom was, he went to synagogue on a Sabbath. Custom means you do something on a regular basis. As his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths, risen with them from the Scriptures. Question is, why for three Sabbaths only? Because he was kicked out of the town after that. <laughs> he didn't have an opportunity for a fourth Sabbath. He had only three Sabbaths, and they kicked him out. So only for three Sabbaths, and you know, he remained true to the commandment of God. So this is what the Bible tells us. From Genesis to Revelation, Saturday is the seventh-day Sabbath. It was the day when God called his children to connect with them, to bless them in a special way. The transition from Saturday to Sunday, point number two. Both Saturday and Sunday were observed from the second to the fifth centuries A.D. And now this is a very interesting fact. For during this period of time, from the 2nd to the 5th centuries, Christians were worshipping on both days. As I said, transition was gradual. They didn't get rid of it all of a sudden. They said, oh, let's do both now. Saturday and Sunday. And you know what happened? Saturday ended up being a day of fasting. It was a religious day. And Sunday ended up being a day of feasting because it was in the honor of his resurrection. Now just think about it as human beings. Saturday a day of fasting, Sunday a day of feasting. Which one is going to become more popular? Just think about it, okay? Now let's look at history. Ecclesiastical history, which, means, which actually means uh, church history. The people of Constantinople, remember Constantinople where the Roman emperors you know, moved their capital? And almost everywhere assembled together on the, on the Sabbath, as well as on the first day of the week. As we said, you know, they started the transition, which custom is never observed at Rome or at Alexandria because they had already moved to the first day of the week. Almost all the churches throughout the world celebrated the sacred mysteries, the Lord's Supper, the bread and the wine, on the Sabbath of every week. Yet, the Christians of Alexandria and at Rome, on account of some ancient tradition, have ceased to do this. So here we have, you know, after the first century, people have moved into the second, third, fourth, and he had a bit of a schism between regions. Some continue with the biblical examples. Others, on the basis of ancient traditions, they ceased to do that. Number three, the pagan sun worship led to church in Rome to change the Sabbath to Sunday. This church, Christian Church of St. Clement, has something very interesting. I'm not going to take you inside the church, but rather I'm going to take you underneath the church. And underneath the church, you find a place where... Uh, was a Mitraic altar for sun worship. Underneath the structure of the church is where they were actually giving honor to the sun god. 
and there was this bit of a competition between the Christians and the pagans, and they said, we need to come up with something, and they said, we're not going to worship the sun because that's just a, a shining star, but we're going to call Jesus our son. And we're going to, in a way, in their mind, they weren't worshiping a planet, they were worshiping God, but they made the transition from Sabbath to Sunday, the day in which pagans were worshiping the sun, and they said, our sun is not the star, but rather the son of God. Anyhow, it was a step towards compromise. Sabbath, a Hebrew word signifying rest. Now, Sunday was a name given by the heathens to the first day of the week because it was the day on which they worshipped the sun. The sun was the foremost god with hidden them. There is truth, something royal, kingly about the sun, making it a fit emblem of Jesus and the sun of justice. Hence, the church in these countries would seem to have said, keep that old pagan name, it shall remain consecrated, sanctified, and thus the pagan Sunday, dedicated to Baldur, the sun god, became the Christian Sunday sacred to Jesus. And this is how the transition happened. Do you remember last night I was thinking about the days of the week? The first day, every single day is dedicated to a planet. Sunday, the most important one. The second day of the week, Monday, was dedicated to the moon. And it goes on. We're not going to waste the time now. But this is how the days of the week were, were dedicated and named in honor of the planets around us. Number four, government laws were made to encourage Sunday worship. As I said, transition was happening gradually. And this is what Constantine did in 321 AD. On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and people residing in cities rest. And let all the shops be... Close. They did not have a say in this. It was a law. It was a law. It was a Sunday law. And it had to do as they were told. Number five, even church forbade Sabbath worship. Look at this statement. Christians shall not Judaize, that is, they shall not keep the Sabbath and be idle on Saturday. But the Lord's day they shall especially honor. And as being Christians shall, if possible, do no work on that day, referring to the first day of the week. If, however, they are found Judaizing, that means resting on the Sabbath, they shall be shut out from Christ. So they were told, if you're going to keep the seven-day Sabbath holy, salvation is removed away from you by us, human beings. As I said, what we're sharing here, my friends, are the plain truths of the Bible. And they were given to us 2,500 years ago for our reproof, for our correction, that we may be wise in the decisions we make, that we may be wise when it comes to who we worship and when we worship. As we look back and we think of Jesus and his disciples, we think, how is it possible that one of his disciples, the one that spent three and a half years with Jesus, saw the miracles of healing, raising from the dead, forgiving people, healing the paralytics, the, the, the blind, the lame, the lepers. How is it possible for him to betray him? We don't understand that. But in the same manner, the prophecy tells us that within Christendom, a power will rise that will fight against Christ. Because when Satan tried to attack the church from outside, and he was unsuccessful, he corrupted the church and he tried to attack from within. That's how deception can be deadly to us. If you open the Catechism of the Catholic Church in order to be introduced to the teachings of the Church, you've got questions like this one, which is the Sabbath day. I don't have to tell you this. They can tell you. The answer is Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why then do we observe Sunday instead of Sabbath? The answer is because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday with no biblical reasoning or authority. Cardinal James Gibbons uh, made this famous statement, you may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday. You know what I appreciate? I appreciate the fact that they're very honest. 
this is something we need to appreciate about that aspect, you know. They, they, at least they do not try to cover that up. They take responsibility that they say, in our own authority, we have made the transfer. There's no biblical reasoning for it. Uh, some of you might be familiar with writings of the Anglican Church. This is their statement regarding the Sabbath. And where are we told in the Scriptures that we are, we are to keep the first day at all? We are commanded to keep the seventh, but we are nowhere commanded to keep the first day. The reason why we keep the first day of the week holy instead of the seventh is for the same reason that we observe many other things, not because the Bible, but because the church has enjoined it. So the question that is important for us tonight is this. Who are you going to listen? The Word of God? Or the traditions of men? Who are you going to worship? How God tells you to worship? Or how Satan is trying to deceive humanity? The greatest battle that is being fought at this stage on the human planet is the battle for worship. And who are you going to worship? So why did Satan try to make the change from Saturday to Sunday? Because he is the Antichrist. The Sabbath reminds us that Jesus is the Lord God Almighty. The Bible says the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. It goes on saying the Son of Man is the Lord even of the Sabbath. And as we said last night, the three major points were these. Sabbath reminds us that God has created us. We are not an accident. We have a beginning. We are made in God's image. We are not alone. Secondly, God provides for us. He's our carer. As we looked at the story of manna, when God rained bread from heaven, there was no manna falling on the Sabbath because God said, I'm going to care for your needs even when you don't see the help around you. And number three, God is our Redeemer. God finished the creation on the sixth day and rested on the seventh. God finished salvation on the sixth day on the cross and rested in the tomb on the seventh day, saying that just as I have created you, I have the power to recreate you, to give you a new life. As we talked about that idea of metamorphosis, the transformation from a caterpillar to a butterfly. That is the work that Jesus is willing to do in our lives. He is the one willing to give our rest. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So who will we follow? Who will we follow? This is the, the choices. The Bible or the tradition? What is your decision? This is the last uh, verse. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the traditions of men. I can hear the heavy heart that God has there saying, You uphold and you honor the traditions of men. But what has happened to the teachings of God? Who will we worship? The Bible tells us that very soon Jesus will return. We looked at the statue and we understand that we're finding ourselves in the time of the toes. We looked at uh, the signs of Jesus' return and we saw there are signs in the religious world, political world, re uh, social world, and natural world. Everything is telling us we are on the right edge of eternity. And now Jesus is telling us not to be deceived because those that follow Satan will experience destruction. But those who embrace Jesus and his truth will experience eternal life. As we take this break, I would like you to think about this question. What is it that holds you back from truly embracing the Word of God? What is it that holds you back from becoming obedient to what the Bible says and putting aside the tradition of man? At the end of our second session, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond to, to this appeal. 
but I'd like you to, to plant this, this seed of thought in your, in your hearts and think about it. Who is it that I worship most? Let me pray for you before we take a break. Father, I want to thank you for this time. And in your love, you are warning us about the deception that is going around. Thank you that because of Jesus, we have a true understanding of the Bible. We want to thank you for the Sabbath that is a great reminder that you are our creator, you are our provider, and you are our redeemer. Lord, help us to seriously think what is it that stops us, that holds us back from fully worshiping you. And if there is something that stops us, is it worth it? May you search our hearts, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on a journey to lost civilizations. See ancient artifacts and long lost ancient scrolls. The strange writing on this clay brick is known as cuneiform. Now the script was used Take the journey of a lifetime and travel to ancient Babylon and the island of Patmos to discover how ancient mysteries reveal the future. A live seminar series. Don't miss any program.